Sarah Levy, who is the CEO of Betterment. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, and then here in person for the other part of the hybrid is Kevin Pleiter, the Capital Markets Business Unit Leader at Cognizant. Uh, so welcome to both of you. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful we can make this work uh, effectively. So Sarah, I think, you know, we, we did our prep session virtually. We obviously scared you off a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I was scared off by this Omicron. Uh, my, my kid's school, there's a, there's a, it's a little getting a little too close to home. So yeah. I thought, you know what, let's In my son's thing. school, there's now like a case every day. I, I, I can sympathize. Yeah, exactly. So I thought, um, you know yeah. what, this sounds I, I, I sympathize. I had both kids in quarantine last week oh, with God. a close contact, so. Uh, well, we Thank you for joining us, uh, however, however you got here. Um, why don't we start off just by the two of you describing your businesses and kind of where they fit into the fintech landscape. Sarah, you can go first. Sure. So Betterment is, a, is the largest independent digital wealth uh, investment advisor in the, in the U.S., and we have three lines of business. Our, we're most known um, for our consumer line, which is a direct-to-consumer wealth management platform. But we also have two smaller growing businesses built off of that same investing platform. One is a 401k record keeper that we uh, offer to small and medium-sized businesses. And the third is we license our technology platform to advisors. Thank you. And Kevin? Yeah, so I lead our capital markets um, group at, at, at Cognizant. Um, that spans everything from uh, asset and wealth management, um, private equity, hedge funds, investment banks, the whole gamut. Uh, it's a large business. Our asset and wealth management business, um, we, we, we provide services to um, a number of the largest um, providers in the U.S., uh, we've either built their infrastructures, um, we help them build some of their advisory front ends, um, we help them build client solutions for their own clients. So we're deeply embedded and involved in the industry. Thank you. And if, if I had to ask both of you in a sentence or two to describe, you know, what aspect of the fintech revolution, if we can call it that, um, excites you the most? Or what do, you, what do you think is the most important contribution that, that fintech is making and can make to the health and wealth of America? Sarah? I mean, there's so much in that question. Um, I, I think there are, there are a tremendous number of opportunities, but I think right now, one in particular that I am excited about is the opportunity for technology to bring a broader set of long-term thinking about retirement benefits um, to a broader subset of small and medium-sized businesses that have not historically had access to those sorts of benefits. And I think that is uniquely an opportunity technology provides because of its efficiency and its low cost. Kevin, you want to take that on? Yeah, I, I would just add on to that, right? I think the democratization of um, the ability to become involved in wealth creation, I think has been something that, that certainly is very important. Um, we've heard from other panelists this morning, there's a big separation between the ability of people to get basic access to a lot of things in life, right? And, you know, education around wealth is, is certainly very important, but being able to get really high quality, high value wealth advice, I mean, Betterment does a tremendous job, but you're able to do it cheaply because of technology. And I think that also then gets into this hyper-personalization. Um, you know, in the past, it was there's a model portfolio. We have five of them. You fit in this bucket, you get the same model portfolio as thousands of people. But now we get to something that is very personal to you and your circumstances. So just to keep it fun, I would agree with you and I would disagree with you. So I, I, would, I would agree with um, your point on personalization. I think that is definitely the next kind of generation of what's gonna happen here. Um, but I think on the democratization of finance, I think in some ways that has already happened. Um, and while there still may be you know, places to go globally, I think by and large in this country, that was sort of the first act of FinTech. Interesting point. Uh Kevin, one of the reasons I'm really happy that Cognizant is, is represented here today is that you, you have a, I don't know about unique, but you have a particular perspective into the legacy banking system as well as the sort of fintech innovators. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that relationship, what it's looked like historically and what it looks like now. Yeah, it's an interesting perspective. Um, you know, we have 
Sarah here talking about what Betterment's done and they've got to build everything without 50, 60 years of legacy. Um, and their ability to provide a tremendous value in a very simple, easy to use front end is, is phenomenal. And a lot of our clients who've been in this business for a long time, look at that and go, I want to be like that too. And many of them have struggled through trying to build it themselves with these legacy infrastructures and whatnot. And what we're seeing now is very much um, this assembly, if you want to call it that, um, of them working with fintechs so that they can assemble solutions that their clients need. And you know what we're seeing is this, this gap. And I would say, if we just think about um, what COVID has done to all of us, the fact that Sarah is sitting here on a camera, we never would have thought about this two years ago. Now it's somewhat normal. In the same way, your relationship with your advisor um, suddenly went completely online. So the digital tools and the gap that some providers had where it was always the advisor talking to the client, when that got broken, then the gap and the divergence in the digital um, enablement that you had suddenly became very, very stark. So our clients are coming to us asking us, how can we build that bridge to the connection with a client that I don't have today that's competitive, that adds a lot of value? And what's very interesting about that is they're not asking us to build that, but help them assemble fintechs and others in that value chain so that they can go to market quickly and bring the value. Yeah, I think this is a really crucial point because, you know, part of the marketing of startups, whether they're fintech startups or other types of startups, is we're changing the world. We're, we're disruptors. We're revolutionary. But actually, the way that these things play out, as you're, as you're implying, is that fintechs and traditional financial players partner together to create the solutions that, frankly, the legacy banks can't do. Is that sort of it? Completely, absolutely. Yeah, and I think I think that often that that often gets overlooked. Um, Sarah, can you talk a little bit about the role of artificial intelligence and machine learning? You know, both within Betterment, but also how that's starting to transform the already existing fintech landscape. Sure. I'll talk about that, but I'll also pair it with sort of the human side. I think one of the sort of before you get to the machine learning, I think one thing that um, people underestimate in the role of fintech is how much human contribution is sort of be behind the behind the technology. Right. And so when we think about offering a great fintech solution, it really sits, I think, at the intersection of the right human contribution. So when we think, for example, about portfolio construction, and then how can technology and AI, which is your question, kind of build on that? Yeah, actually, um, but I, I do think- yeah. I, that, This is another thing that I think is, is, is often overlooked. We, we think about artificial intelligence as being juxtaposed against human intelligence, right? Like, well, the robots will take our jobs would be like the extreme formulation of that. But, but actually, I think the, the, the more I talk to people in the fintech space, the more I realize the, the optimal situation, it seems to me, is having machines do what machines do best so that the humans in the company can do what humans do best. Does that, is, is that? that a, a, yeah, that's exactly where I was going, yeah. exactly. So, so I think, you know, coming back to what Kevin said earlier um, about personalization, right? I think where the machine learning is really, um, you know, the, the first phase, if you will, was around democratization of finance and then things like tech smart in, in our business, things like tech smart tools, right? Where we can have text lost harvesting, which is something that if you sort of teach the computer to do it, the technology to do it, it only gets kind of better and, you know, rinse and repeat. And it's something that's very hard to implement as a, you know, the, as a human without the technology. I think in this next phase, it's really where technology is taking us is to really one-to-one -one the, the opportunity to tailor that experience. So whether it's tailoring your portfolios, whether it's the sort of rebalancing and other technology kind of just getting better and better and smarter and smarter, you know, we can then overlay that with rules that we can offer, you know, again, personalized rules around things you do want to invest in and things you don't want to invest in on, you know, your willingness to pay taxes and to what level. Um, and all of those kind of personal choices can feed into the technology and help the technology drive a better personalized outcome. And so that's really where I think it's taking us. That's very interesting. Uh, 
Kevin, before we came on stage, you were talking to me about a, a sort of two different pieces of the assembly question, assembling for the client. Uh, do you want to uh, expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I think it really, you know, just Sarah kind of answered the question to some degree already, right? Because clients are becoming more sophisticated. Um, we saw, you know, five or six years ago, a bunch of um, fintechs that I would call investigation, right? So investment education is kind of what they were and really what they were doing was assembling a whole lot of data around the preferences of people and whatnot. And many of them got bought by larger providers. Um, but as you think about, you know, what Sarah was just talking about, this hyper-personalization, um, being able to provide clients with something that's unique. And if you think about um, what that is, when you think about um, values-based investing, what ESG is bringing to the table, it's just another choice. A lot of people through crypto trading, everyone's talking about the price of Bitcoin. Um, it's also opened up people's minds to a different set of asset classes. The old 60-40, you know, with 60% equity and 40% um, fixed income. Why should that be true anymore? Um, where do NFTs fit in? Where, where does, where does NFT fit in? Purchases fit in? You know, where if you look at Asia, you know, one of the hot things in Asia right now for wealth investing is carbon credit trading. So, you know, you think about that and you, you start to think, well, where's that demand coming from? There's better education, better knowledge, better tools, um, better access. And as Sarah was saying with the AI, what it's giving people the ability to do is think about the other things that are important, not the basics like tax harvesting, for example. Um, now, I think the big questions are, how are you providing the service and a lot, of more, lot more transparency? Um, and in the prep for this, we talked about, you know, payment for order flow. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, you know, gamification. Yeah, you, I'm going to get to that. You know, so I'm, I'm to, sorry. Can, I'm sorry to get sorry, there no, quick. No worries. I can get to it now. Um, you know, it's important and uh, and I think completely fair to talk about democratization and personalization. Those are both terrific goals and wealth creation, wealth management, et cetera. Um, you know, my perception is that very few technological revolutions uh, push only in one direction. So while good things are happening, there's a very decent chance that some bad things may happen. And I, I'd like to ask each of you, starting with Sarah, um, you know, are there downsides to, to, to the fintech revolution that we're undergoing? Are there, are there things that are, that are happening that you would prefer not to see happen? Yeah, I think, well, certainly gamification. I mean, where Kevin started to go on, you know, gamification would be a, a great example. But I think, yes, I think there are a number of downsides. And I think, you know, one, we, we at Betterment are a fiduciary. And so that's um, that's really important for us. Just, I, I'm is, just going to explain quickly that, that under the yep. law, a fiduciary, as opposed to a broker dealer, has to advise clients to do something that's in their best interest. The broker dealer really, or whoever, just wants to sell you a product. That's an important distinction. Yes, that, it, that's a great clarification, right? Because that really impacts sort of how we think about. So we talk about whether it's payment for order flow. Payment for order flow unto itself is not a problem. It is just one of the ways that transactions are being monetized. I think where we get into potentially dangerous territory is when the platform and the consumer's um, end goals are out of sync. And so, for example, gamification encourages a lot of active trading behavior. Well, active trading behavior on average and over time is not in the best interest of the consumer, right? If you think about the asymmetry of information, right, the little guy typically doesn't have the, the same kind of access to information or the education, to your point earlier, right, that, that many of the professionals have. And so, you know, active trading can get you burned, right? And so, you know, we preach very much a you know buy and hold diversification long term um, but I think what technology allows is it allows for really ease of use in terms of that transaction and if you get the wrong signals right red and green on your app a lot of people get um, very reactionary to that information and so I think that that's kind of a danger that we as an industry really need to work to fight against, you know, and, and at, again, as a fiduciary, I think we sit in a very good spot there because we are incentivized to do what is right for the customer. And so we think a lot about that. Um, the other thing, I, I would just give you one other 
which is I think there's a lot of advertising that like things are free. And you know, this was true in technology generally, but when things are quote free, somebody needs to pay for it somehow. So it generally means the customer is the product, right? When you think about when you search and your activity in search, when you think about social media and the ads you're being served. And so I think that is also something that kind of can dangerously intersect with FinTech where it's not as transparent to the end user that nothing is really free. Yeah, I, I have to say when I first started reporting on Robinhood and looking into Robinhood, um, that what what disturbed me the most was less the gamification, although that's deeply weird, but more the um, the pushing of people toward options trading. You know, they, 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 they give you a quiz when you sign up for a Robinhood uh, account, like how much experience do you have? And they're giving uh, the ability to trade options to people who, you know, say they've had like one year experience. Like, I've been in the stock market since the 90s. I don't think I should be options trading. It's just, it, it's so irresponsible. And you see these people that show up in the in the state lawsuits who are trading, you know, 60, 70 times a day uh, on options, which is just a, a formula for, for disaster. Well, how about options on margin? Yeah, options on margins. Um, we, we are down to three and a half minutes. I, I, I want to look a little bit into the new year. Um, Kevin, what do you at Cognizant see as the, the most exciting and most important developments coming in the fintech space for next year? Yeah, I think... To me, um, a lot of this now is the, this convergence towards much more of the personalization of one. And I think the outcome orientation that Sarah talked about, to me, will continue to evolve. Um, one of the things I like, and we talk about gamification here, what I see is a potential for a trend. And if you look up, a, there's a fintech in the UK called ULife, very similar to Sarah. What they do, though, is um, life insurance products um, that they provide um, services for to small, medium business in the UK. But what they've done is they've gamified this. So the company gives you a Fitbit, you do your steps, you show you're doing healthy living, you get rewards, and those rewards give you points. So this whole notion of an outcome orientation, I see um, potentially, I'd love to see um, some companies working with someone like Betterment, for example, to say, if you get more and more healthy, the 401k matching will do, will improve that. So for every 10,000 steps, we'll give you $100 towards um, your 401k extra matching, above and beyond what our standard company policy is. So to me, that is a potential to start to engage people differently, connecting wealth and health together, um, which I think right now are very separate. And if you look at you know what fintechs have done, they've democratized, they're helping personalize and I think the next step after that is really taking people to a place where it's their full whole life view of the world, their health, their wealth, how they're connected with their employer. And I think that personalization will go to that step, hopefully. And, and I think that'll be great for um, both the industry and for, for obviously the, uh, the people in that. And Sarah, what will uh, Betterment be focused on in 2022? Yeah, so so I love that answer, Kevin, because um, that that definitely hits one of um, kind of one of the three I was going to give you: um, financial wellness and how do we think about the four hundred one k as kind of only the beginning and sort of the tip of the spear in a financial wellness package as you think about that. So I think you will start to see from us that we will be adding incrementally kind of new financial wellness services as part of that package, um, particularly to respond to um, employers now really in the fight for their life for talent. So I think that's a really, really big one. Um, I think a second one, we didn't talk much about ESG, but I would say for us, you know, the continued evolution of ESG investing and the idea that you can have passive investing, but potentially active involvement um, at the same time is sort of a new idea around, you know, social activi activism intersecting with diversified in investing. And I think that's a really, really exciting space. And then the third one, which you also hit on, but I haven't talked about is um, as we think about crypto, how does crypto as now a $3 trillion asset class intersect with a long-term diversified portfolio strategy as opposed to the sort of Robin Hood of crypto, you know, as opposed to day trading in crypto and watching, you know, Bitcoin fluctuate and getting an ulcer. How do we think about sort of, you know, two to three percent of your diversified portfolio? How might that, you know, complement and get you a better long-term outcome? So those are some of the ideas we're looking at. Thank you. Uh, last question, lightning round. Uh, 
Will we see in 2022 a fintech startup get so large that it will buy a legacy player? So like a year ago, we were talking about Visa buying Plaid. It didn't happen because of the Department of Justice, but the people at Plaid are probably happy it didn't happen because it was valued at $5 billion and now it would probably be worth $20 billion. But will we see a Plaid buying a Visa? I think the potential's there. I mean, if you look at, um, you know, some of the large payment providers, I mean, they're so big now. Um, you mean like I, a PayPal or PayPal, yeah, Square. Square, these guys, I mean, absolutely the potential for them to now um, push into new industries, go into wealth, go into other areas, absolutely is possible. I noticed that now that Nubank has gone public, it's, its market capitalization is significantly larger than Brazil's largest bank. Um, Sarah? Yeah, I think it's certainly possible. I think banking licenses is one place where that's kind of an obvious. Um, so buying, you know, a small region. That's a bank, really good point. Um, that's, that's probably the most obvious example for yeah. me where it's pretty likely. Uh, we are up against time. Um, please join me in thanking these fantastic panelists. Thank you. Uh, and one bit of housekeeping. We are about to take a five minute break, not Till two, two, two twenty-five. Five minutes, I was told by the, the oh, general. Oh, really? Okay, yes. Caitlin. Uh, so uh, we'll see you again okay. in five minutes. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, Thank you. you.